Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade, Twin Cities by Night. Homecoming is our second story arc that takes place in the spring of 2010 and then Twin Cities in Minnesota. Follow the story of Ophelia, a toreador played by Alex, Jonathan, a venture played by David, Katow, a gangrel played by Joaquin, and William, a venture played by Slavic, as they once again find themselves working together to find out who, or what, is targeting them and those close to them. If you'd like to contact us, you can reach out to us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM, or on Facebook at Twin Cities by Night. We hope you enjoy Let's start with Katow. So you're driving about the city. You're not having too much luck. It's around, I'd say, midnight, a little bit after midnight. You're trying to find any sign like of, of anyone that's disappeared at all. You haven't had any luck at all in that. Okay, okay, okay. Nothing so far from my end, which means maybe someone would rather try to fill a police report or something. We should call Chase and see if he has anything. So I call up Chase. All right, Chase, as you're driving with Ophelia to the residence, which is kind of in the upper middle class part of southern Minneapolis, uh, your phone rings and you see it's Katow. All right, I'll turn it on through my car, take her phone. How's it going there, Special K? Chase, I've been uh, trying to find out. Uh, I need you to use your uh, fake ID or whatever it has uh, to find out if there's been any reports of missing uh, prostitutes in the uh, area. You looking for one in particular? I'm sure I could set you up with somebody. Not like that. I'm saying that Markin, when he uh, he was when I, when I uh, he was uh, at my apartment, my dog could smell uh, sex on him. And the last time I checked, we don't smell like that. It's only humans can. And he's been known to be a bit. Uh, he was even known to be violent even when he was a human. So now you can. Well, you pretty sure you got an idea. Uh, I'll look into it. Was that it? Anything else? Uh. No, that's pretty much it. Have you got anything on your end? On my end? As in what? Have you found anything? Have I Ophelia, found you're hearing anything? this whole conversation. Because I take it you're riding with Chase, right, Ophelia? I am. I'm in shotgun. I'm just looking at the window smoking right now. Uh, I, I'm in the middle of something. I'll let you know if I uh, come across anything when I'm done. All right, you do that as soon as you do. Yes, sir. Special K. William, so you, uh, last we left, you were driving around kind of just in a daze of not wanting to be left alone for obvious reasons. Yeah, I think I'll go, I'll go think about, I'll think about what I'm going to do next in my haven. You're, you're heading back to your haven. staring at my phone, not sure what to do. All right, I'll let you dwell on that. that. That's good. All right, so Jonathan and Ophelia, you guys are slowly getting through the neighborhood, to the neighborhood where Brendan Peters resides it's uh still kind of raining it's been rainy for like the last week been kind of a wet spring which usually means that it's going to be a very annoying humid hot summer comes from this from your guys experience being in the cities later so you usually see a bunch of lights out you just see a bunch of front porch lights on as you're coming through it's around 10 30 you get to the front of the house and you actually see it's a kind of a brick house a nice house so it has a rather large lawn nice huge thick oak tree that's in the front has a picture window in the front you can actually see light coming through it and everything. It looks like it's probably a TV's on, but there's also bright lamps that are inside of it. You can see a figure walking around in there. The driveway has a car in it, and and the trim of the house is, is kind of a cream-colored tr- trim, but most of it's obviously brick, but it's a rather large house, probably 300 or 3,000, 4,000 square feet. I'd like to have a conversation with Ophelia while we're driving before we get there. Yeah, go ahead. Scene's on you guys. I'm actually very glad to have you alone here with me in the car so that we can have a private conversation, the two of us. I'll look at him and raise my eyebrow. Well, you as a a whip for the Toreador clan puts you in a unique situation where you can actually do me a favor. Do you a favor? Okay, what kind of favor? Well, from what I understand it, you you have this uh, preoccupation with all of these caitiffs and thin bloods within the city. Yes, you could say that. And you're concerned about their well-being? That's right. I just don't like to see people get hurt. Well, see, this is an opportunity for us to help each other then. What are you what are you what are you proposing? There's only one way that this is going to come out 
in anyone in any particular good favorable situation for the caves and that's if we accept them into the Camarilla. I agree. Well, but uh with the scourge around I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon without a confrontation. Well, you can let me worry about that. What what I'm proposing though is that we we take this to the council as right. a suggestion that we integrate the caves into the city. That's it. No. That's a good idea. They're not going to do that. Right. If you just bring in all of these clanless vampires into the Camarilla, they're mm. they're going to overwhelm us in numbers. Right. And they're too disjointed to have any real, you know, face for them. Yeah. And having that many vampires thrown into it, it'd be like you know, accepting China as the as the fifty third state. Of the United States, they're going to have more <laughs> votes than everybody else in the country. So, here's my Where are you proposal. Going with this? Okay. By accepting the caitiffs into the city, we we ensure that we we can have our thumb on them, and to do that, we integrate them into each of the clans, kind of like a surrogacy. You know, each clan would be able to you know, adopt a number of these caitiffs into their, into their numbers. And then that way the clan still control the council because none of the, none of the council members are going to want to just flood in all of these kindred and then lose the control of the city that they have. But if we divide up their numbers amongst us, we can integrate them into our clans and maintain the status quo while still keeping our thumbs on all of these these clanless vampires that don't know how everything is ran. It could work in theory. Do you think the prince would go for it, though? Uh, the prince only has as much control over the city as we give him. Right, and if we can convince him that it was his idea all along, maybe he'd be more likely to <laughs> run with well, it. Well, based off of what we know about the, the prince already, I don't see him taking this as a suggestion, which is why we're not going to give it to him as a suggestion. We're going to give it to the council and the council's going to force him into doing it. Right. And and how do we get in contact with all of these caitiffs? <laughs> I can only burn one bit bridge at a time. Well, we, we already have a couple that we have access to and I'm sure right. that they've ran across to other members. So the, the scourge is already hunting these vampires down. We just, mm hunt them down ourselves and that way we can grab them in groups and, you know, at least track them down, assess how many of them there are, but I'm not yeah. going to do this for free. What do you want in return then? I want Carlos. Do you want Carlos? Like how? I want to take Carlos as my surrogate child. I mean, it's and not, I can't exactly stop you, can I? He's he's free to do as he wants. No one's ever free to do what they want. <laughs> well, it's, not me, it's, not you. Why, so why are you he, asking me for this favor? It's not really something I can do. Anything but it about. is. But it is. You see, in order to get all this started, we're going to have to get the ball rolling. Mm. And we're going to bring Carlos in first and present him to the council. And it's going to be suggested that he's going to be given to me to raise and train and, you know, indoctrinate into the, into the Camarilla. And what if they don't go along with it? What if they execute him the moment he's presented? That that's what you're here for. And that's the favor I need from you. You're going to convince your primogen that mm -hmm. this is the right course and that he should be my child. And you're going to convince Cato to convince his primogen to do the same. Okay. I'll look into it. I can talk to Gina as well and see what she thinks. She seems to be on side. Here, here's the problem that I see. That if a Ventru comes in and says, hey, I want to increase the number of Ventru in the city, all the other primogens are going to see this as a grab for power and that we're trying to overwhelm the, the already outnumbered various clans of the Camarillo. So but, you're saying I need to bring someone in with me, K-Town needs to bring someone in with him, all at the same time? 
No, not necessarily all at the same time. I mean, we we can use this as a precursor at setting the precedence of how this whole situation is going to work. Right. Kind of think of it as California. We're going to test run this with me and Carlos. And then this will give everybody else an idea of how we're going to integrate the rest of the kindred, the uh, rest of the natives into the city. I can already think of a couple of pitfalls here. So, I can see a couple pitfalls as well because the Bruja aren't going to accept this. Um, you know, the Tremere are they going to want to give up their secrets to a bunch of thin bloods? Well, and you know, it's it, the way that it's going to work is we're going to have to integrate these individuals into our clans. That doesn't mean, hey, you know, you're you're just going to bam be one of the crew and everything they they're going to have to accept the same precedence that the rest of the kindred do they're going to have to be able to before they can become an active member of the camarilla they have to prove themselves to not only their sire but to the prince of the city that hey this child is now an accepted member of the camarilla and these caitiffs are going to have to go through the same thing it's not like they're going to come up and just go, hey, here's your card-carrying member of the Camarilla. They're going to be given a surrogate sire, and that sire is going to train that individual. And once they feel that that person meets what would be expected of their clan, then that individual would be presented to the prince. And then at that point in time, they would be a member of the Camarilla. And that might be five years. It might be 10 years. In some cases with the Tremere, maybe it's going to take 30 or 40 years before they can accept the person to be, you know, valued enough to be considered a member of their clan. But the reality is, is they're either going to accept it or they're going to die. Because if they don't join the Camarilla, we we have a crazy Malkavian that's staking them out in the sunlight. Right. I'll I'll put I'll put the idea forward. I'll talk to Kaitao. It sounds like it could work. I think it's going to take a lot of effort and persuasion. Well, that's what we're good at. It's persuading. It is what we're good at. All right. I just think it'll come better from you, you talking to Kital, than it will from me. If we already have two of the whips on board, then that's a good case. Yeah, and the Ventru will that. support me. Okay. So that's three of seven. That's that's not bad odds. I'll take those odds to Vegas any day. All right. I'll 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 get the ball rolling once we're done here. All right. How, let's how go. How far away are we? I don't know. I think we're close enough to shoot somebody in the face. Uh, yep, you guys see the scene that I brought forth to you there. So you kind of hear right, the slight right. drizzle, the rain on the hood of the car. Now that the engine stop, you're going down the sides there. You kind of make, can make it out a little bit, but with the with the car, the the noise of the car engine coming to a stop, a halt. Yeah, you definitely feel the you, you know the rain even more as you're sitting there. That's all right. I'm gonna get my FBI badge and you know my Glock 23. And Ophelia, you have your little femme fatale piece, right, in your FBI badge. That's right. FBI badge. Indeed. You guys are uh, heading towards the front the door. Front door. Are you guys ringing the doorbell or anything? Yeah, well, I'll knock. I'll knock on the door. You see a lady come walking out of the kitchen. She has like a dish rag. You know, and she's like, looks like she's drying her hands off. Uh, she's wearing, uh, you know, uh, comfortable jeans, looking jeans, has a blouse on. Uh, she has. Longer amber or reddish blonde hair, has some glasses, some freckles, uh, looks to be about 5'8", you know, 120, 125 pounds, somewhat attractive, you know, and she, but she's definitely, you can tell she's a stay at home mother type. But she comes and, uh, answers the door. You have like the screen door thing in front of you guys as she answers. And she's like, oh, hello, can I, can I help you with something? She's cooking at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, uh, yeah, 10 30 at night. Yeah. Well, it looks like she's washing dishes, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to flip open up my badge for, like, Detective Halen, FBI. Uh, we're here oh. to speak with a Mr. Peters. Uh, he's not here at the moment, but you can come in and, and talk and get out of the rain if you would like. Would you happen to know where your Peters is? He he went out to do some errands, but he should be back soon if you want to come in and wait. If you could call him and let him know that we're here with you. Yeah, yeah, give me a second. She, yeah, definitely. She kind of like pushes the screen door open. She turns away and walks towards her cell phone, which you can see is laying on top of the TV. Do you guys stay outside or are you guys coming in? Or No, I'm going to go inside. I'm not going to get okay. any wetter yeah. than I already am. You guys uh, walk in. the. Uh, you walk in and you see there's like a nice kind of wall-mounted TV, about 50-inch TV sitting there with a little burrow underneath it. There's a sectional couch 
uh, that looks like it's made out of like a soft, almost corduroy kind of material, kind of tannish color. There's a, a coffee table there. Pictures I'm going to kind of case the place, look at pictures and photos and see if I can discern, you know, if he's got children or what kind of. Uh... Definitely. You see a family picture there. You see a gentleman. Looks like he's kind of balding on top, has some gla- has glasses on, uh, looks to a white, well, is white, Caucasian, kind of thinner. Uh, he's wearing like a sweater vest with a, with a shirt and a tie underneath. And you see three boys. They look like they're ranging from the age is between 10 to six. All three of them all have kind of their mother's blondish hair. You really can't tell the color of the dad's hair because he's lost his hair. And you see her sitting there, uh, you know, and it's, uh, and they're actually like kind of outside and it looks like it might have to be taken at a park during autumn. Uh, you hear her on the phone, like, yeah, babe, if you can uh, head back, there's, there's two, uh, they said they're FBI agents. She's sitting there talking to them on the phone and she hangs up and she's like, yeah, he, he's on his way back. He should be here in about 10 minutes. If you'd like to have a seat, are you thirsty or is there, do you want a coffee? I can make some coffee. Plate coffee, please. Yeah, 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 definitely. I'll have she, the same. Yeah, and she walks in and you hear her fiddling around right in there and she's like, I got the pot starting. I'm sorry, I didn't have any made, but it'll only take, it's, I have one of those quick to be done in a few minutes. And she sits down at the, the sectional, like at the opposite end of you guys. You know how sectionals make an L, you know, and you guys are like at one end and she kind of sits at the other. And she's well, like, I'm going to uh, continue to stand. Sorry. You're standing? All right. Yeah. I was gonna say, do you want to use the bathroom? You go ahead and use the bathroom. And she, she kind of motions. She's like, it's the second door on the left. I'm actually not going to use the bathroom. I'm going to look around the house a bit. First thing you're going to do is you're going to roll me, give me a dexterity and stealth difficulty. We'll say seven. So for two successes, uh, you're able to get around there. You kind of walk and you look in the hallway and you see like three boys rooms. You know what I mean? That looked at, you know, your normal clutter that kids have and you make it into the bedroom and you can see that they have like kind of a king size bed with a nice wooden headboard have a nice dresser with the tv on on there that have ceiling fan with the lamp and a couple of lamps with end tables at both sides you can see to the right that there's actually leads into a bathroom where you see a tub and a nice kind of bigger shower that is all clear and there's like two walk-in closets that are in that are in there too you can't see in the closets but you just kind of taking a quick glance around yeah Okay. Um, I'm going to see a computer around or anything. You don't see a computer in, in the room. You saw a computer in the living room area, like a little, little like mini office without the doors kind of area. But, you know, she would see you if you went in there. Like right when you walked in, it was to the right. I want to activate all specs. All right. And your aspects is activated. I'm going to cut to David. Yeah. I'm going to cut I'm gonna to David, okay? This is Peter's busy with some random questioning. Your uh, husband's out quite late tonight. Has he been conducting a lot of business in the evening these days? Well, yeah, they have him. Uh, he's working a lot at Twin Cities. He's been working at the Twin Cities Mental Health Institute specialists. In the evenings, a lot on the third floor, they've, they've had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stuff going on, I guess he says. So he's usually there at night uh, having to meet with patients and everything like that. So Is that so? I'm not going to say it, but we just came from there, and obviously he wasn't there. But anyway, yeah, but you're on the second floor. But yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So he kind of comes and goes a lot. You know, he's been really busy with that. He's a hard worker. He he kind of, you know, has done a lot for us. And my son. So he's been doing like a lot that. of working at night. Yeah. Th- yep. Lately, he has. Yeah, God, that's I can't imagine that. That's that's a lot of sleeping during the day. Right. You got to. Yeah. Yeah. He has peaceful. to, unfortunately. Yeah. We, we kind of usually he sleeps at work, though. He says he just kind of goes in his office and. You know, we, but he makes it home for dinner. He makes it home and, and helps the kids with their homework and everything like that. So he hasn't even been coming home during the day to rest? Not for like the last couple of weeks, to be honest. But he said there's like the, there's a huge project going on and a lot of uptick. And honestly, and I'm not going to lie to you, sir, a lot of the stuff that he does just kind of goes over my head. I, I, I you know, I, I went into business administration when I met him in school. You know, he obviously went down the medical route. So my brain isn't just built for that. Have you noticed him bringing any new friends over recently when he comes in for dinner? Well, actually, sometimes I wish he would bring friends, you know, to be honest. He's just kind of been always one to lose himself in his work and everything. I try to get him to be social, but he's not too much of a social butterfly. Losing himself in his work. Huh. Very interesting. Yeah, he, How's his appetite? Yeah, I, you Is know, he eating a lot when he comes home? Well, you know, he's just, he says he grabs a bite out, you know, when he's out and about and everything like that, but I really don't. Grabbing uh, a bite, you know. So he, he comes home and just visits. He doesn't necessarily eat dinner with you. You know, but, uh, he says it's going to all, you know, he says it's all going to end soon and everything. So he says he'll be back to his normal schedule soon. So that's why I'm 
but but why is the FBI? Why are you guys interested in him? I mean, I'm I'm I understand. I'm trying to be hospitable here and everything, but I just feel that it's kind of odd that the FBI is uh, looking into my husband. Well, you know, he does work in a place where there's troubled people. So is it like one of his patients that yeah you're interested in? Is it why he's been working so late? Uh, I'm and not I'm at liberty cut. to share a lot of information with you at this time. All right, I'm going to cut to Ophelia. Ophelia, so you, you got your heightened senses. Give me a perception and alertness roll. Difficulty, yeah, heightened senses on. So give me difficulty five. Two. Sitting yeah. there uh, in the bedroom, and you, you know, you you start start concentrating, and 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 you, you're sitting there, close your eyes, and you catch a whiff of like. It seems to be like a fresh dinner there. And as you smell, as you're smelling that dinner, you also smell like a, a kind of a, a fine wave of decay that rides underneath it. Uh, it's definitely not the first thing you notice when it came from the kitchen, but it's a fresh meal that you notice. But yeah, the smell of decay is just kind of down there a little bit too. And it, you're, oh, you're going to sneak towards the kitchen? Yeah, yeah. So as you uh, give me another dexterity and stealth difficulty six or seven, excuse me, difficulty seven. Oh my god, four successes. Ooh. Oh wow. All right, so Dave, give me a perception and alertness roll, difficulty seven, if you will. I just want to see if you kind of notice what she's doing. Uh, one success. So, uh, Ophelia, you're walking by. You see her back. She's sitting there facing. You kind of catch her in the corner of your eye. Dave's standing, talking to her, and she's still sitting and just like looking up at him while she's talking. Not in a comfortable way, you know what I mean? But Dave's just kind of doing this thing where he's like walking around the room, looking at things, playing the role. As you go turn into the kitchen, you see a dinner table set with like pot roast and mashed potatoes steaming and vegetables steaming. And you see three sons, like three sons from like the age of 10 to 6. They're all three tied up to the chair. They all have gags in their mouth, like like rags in their mouth. You see that you can tell that two are still alive, but you see one, the youngest, who's like a four-year-old, looks like he's probably been dead. And you, you're not a mortician, but it's been a while. And just, he's just kind of sitting there. And you see the other two kind of have like a malnourished, sickly look to them, like they're probably not too far behind from okay. what's going on. Well, um, do they notice me? Are they awake? You see like one, he kind of like... His eyes, the oldest, and he's closest to you. He's at the head of the table. He kind of like looks like si- sideways at you. You know what I mean? And you see like a little t- a tear like start coming down his eye a little bit. But it looks like he probably can't cry that much because he's obviously looks very malnourished and dehydrated. I'm going to cut to Dave yeah. real quick though. Okay. Sure. What's going on? So Dave, as you're standing there talking or you see uh, the lady, she gets up a little bit. You know what I mean? And she's like starts walking towards where the TV's at. Let me get that yeah. for you. She like, not, not, no, no, no. She's not doing anything. She's just getting up as like, and yeah, I know it sounds all ominous with what Ophelia just found, you know, but you know how sometimes when you're sitting there talking to someone and one person's kind of getting up and moving around, the other person's sitting. I know sometimes I feel uncomfortable if I'm like the one sitting. So I'll get up and just kind of like linger. You know what I mean? Where I was sitting. That's pretty yeah. much what she does. She's, she kind of gets up at the end of the And I'm going to look ahead. like alertly at her when she starts to get up. Yeah. And I'm like, no, please stay seated. Stay comfortable. I just, I've had a lot of coffee today and sitting down. <laughs> I'm a little, like stop standing, you know, standing there. She looks at you and she turns around. She just bangs her head like on the, on the corner edge of the TV, like just while it starts walloping her head on the TV while you're standing there and watching it. I'm going to cut to Ophelia real quick. As Ophelia, as you're standing here looking at this kid, you hear him like mumble, like, mm, like he's trying to say something to you as uh, that rag is in his throat, that his mouth is preventing him from speaking. Okay, uh, I'll take the rag out of his mouth. Boom, as you take the rag out of his mouth, Dave, cutting back to you, she stops it in her head on the TV, and you see she kind of has like a gash along her forehead that there's blood coming down. She looks at you and she says, don't be afraid. And, you, and her voice though, is sounding like it's, it's like taking on a tone that doesn't quite belong to her. But she says, uh, don't be afraid. Uh, we just want to talk with you. We have what you're looking for. Jonathan, we have what you both are looking for. And then as you, you hear her say that, Ophelia, well, when, when she's pulling the rag out of his mouth. she starts banging her head Go on ahead. the door, I'm going to place my hand yeah. on my on pistol. On the TV. On, on the TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put my hand on yeah. my pistol and pull it out and just chamber around. That, that's doesn't... not normal. That, no, no. When you start banging your head on the wall like a crazy person, <laughs> from the question that I've established, that we are, I, I've already you know, come to the conclusion that her husband has been turned and is most likely 
the third individual in the group with with uh, what's his name, Star, and obviously this guy. And yeah. I know he's on his way. When she starts banging yeah. her head on the wall like a crazy person, You're shit's going edge. to go down. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I mean it's like okay, you know we're yeah. we're we're in the lion's den right now. Feel as you like are about you know as you pull the rag out of his mouth, you hear her say that. So what are you doing, Ophelia? I hear what I hear that coming from the lounge area. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is right, like only like six feet away. So you hear it pretty clearly, you know. Oh, you hear like a whack, whack, whack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear like a crack of plastic and like you know what I mean. Like she's hitting her head on the TV yeah. there, the, the the edge of the TV. As you pull the rag out, Jonathan, you hear now from the kitchen. From it sounds like uh, an exhausted, but it doesn't sound like so, it sounds like it's obviously coming from an exhausted, malnourished boy. But the voice doesn't belong to that malnourished boy, if that makes sense. You know, almost as if, for lack of a better term, that the kid is possessed in a way. You hear him say, "Bring your group. Talk to us on the third floor. No one will see you, nor will anyone know that you're there." Then you catch that, David, from behind you, and then as you're staring, looking at this kid, Ophelia. You see the other kid now is starting to mumble. He looks like he's about maybe seven years old, the middle kid of the group. Okay. I'm going to uh, walk up to the woman, the, yeah. the mother, and I have and she's my firearm in, firearm in in one hand loaded, right? I'm yeah, going to yeah. walk up to her and put my hand on her on her neck and uh-huh. see if there's a pulse. Is this woman even alive at this point, or is she, you know, a kindred? Oh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there, there's a pulse, definitely, and like almost like comatose now, like she's just staring ahead as the blood goes down her face. As you come up to her and you p- grab her to feel her, and you feel the doom 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 of her of her pulse, and you see the blood go down. You know she's alive, but you feel like the beast for a little bit was clawing at the back of your neck as, as you step away from her after you feel it. You know, so the kid, the second kid's looking at you, Ophelia, like straight at you now. Like, no weariness to his eyes, but he has that rag in his mouth, and he's kind of, you see him, like, trying to talk to you also. I'll take his rag out as well. As you slowly pull the rag out, you feel fear creeping up to you. He says, don't tell anyone where you're going, just your group, all four of you. We want to help you, but if you tell anyone, every secret that you've been hiding will make sure come out and open. And he's just standing there looking. Jonathan, you hear that from this kid in there. And as you're staying there, all of a sudden you see the ch- the lady, like her head bounces back a little bit. And then she looks at you and she uh, looks straight at you, Jonathan. And she's like, plus, we know what you're looking for and the answers you want. Jonathan, we have him waiting for you, ready for his punishment. You catch um, that, Ophelia. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then the, the one kid that you originally pulled the, the 10-year-old, the rag out, he looks at you and he says, Star loves you. And she wants to explain, Ophelia. She was scared and trapped, but now she is free. And then the final kid looks and he screams at the top of his lungs. Knowledge is strength. And then he looks, he's like, meet us there on the third floor at one. And all of a sudden you see like their eyes roll. And then like they just, their heads kind of fall forward. And the chick right by you, she falls like a sack of bricks. and Her head hits the wall again. Her head hits the wall. She falls down. But she's laying there still breathing. Mr. Uh, Katow. Rolling down the street, man of the night, trying to talk <laughs> to the street walkers, trying to figure out what's going on. What are you up to now? Okay, so I've got nothing so far. And I'm waiting on Jonathan, so I guess I'll head over to the Medusa just to wait for him there. Just... As you head over to the Medusa, you uh, see the new bouncer there. Lee, he's kind of standing there. You see his bartender. Uh, you still are like kind of like feel like a pang of guilt because as you see the bartender there, you realize that you remember how you got, uh, her memory was completely wiped from her when that was going on. She sees you walk in. She kind of oddly goes around the bar and walks up to you. And she's like, hey, uh, the boss isn't here, but uh, are you, you just want to wait for him or? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just it's yeah, I just want to wait for him. You. Yeah. So. And she's like, come <laughs> a weird combination of guilt and just creeping me out. This is like I don't know how to deal with you. As she, she's like, well, here, sit at the bar, sit at the bar, and she kind of like commotions to you. And as you sit at the bar, she kind of goes behind the bar and she's like staring straight ahead of you. And she kind of grabs your hand in a weird, like a flirtatious kind of charm you kind of way. And you see her, she's just kind of like rubbing each other. She's like, you always seem kind of alone. You look like you do some company and everything. 
Uh, no, thank you. I'm fine. D- just, just don't touch me. She's like, you always seem so tense, though, and you and the boss always seem to kind of. There's always this tension between you guys, and I just want to know if there's anything I can do. You know, like I, I know he can be unfair sometimes. I mean, he kind of ignores me at times too, but you know, I, I'm a uh, always looking for something too. And if if you ever need companionship, you know I'm always available, right? Oh, hey, wait a minute! This is my goal to become a hooker. No, no, no! I want to. I knew you were going to bring this up. And out of character, what did Slavic? What did William tell you when you started messing around with creating a ghoul? Yeah, I specifically remember you, forgetting that. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do, you, do you remember William? What you told him? Yeah, no they'll way. do. Um, they'll they'll try to make me happy. Or they'll try to do things because they feel hurt too. You know yeah. what I mean? And she's basically feels like she's not getting enough attention from you. So what 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 do some women do when they feel like that they're not getting attention from a significant other? You may try to <laughs> make someone jealous, right? And I don't mean to do this in like a high school musical kind of way. This is you gotta think she's a two things have happened to this lady. How did you do that happen to her? Which there's still remnants of it, like in her subconscious. And two is the fact that she is addicted to the most, one of the most potent drugs that are out there, you know, but only two steps bound. So she feels like she wants that other step. She wants the emotional comfort of the person who's giving that to her. Plus, she's having, obviously, in the back of her head, something telling her that she's been through a tragedy. So for her to be stuck behind a bar, running errands, being by herself, there's definitely a feel of this chick's in some kind of emer- emotional turmoil, I would say, you know. Katow, why don't you give me a perception and empathy role, difficulty six, to see if your character even picks up on that. In re- all reality, she's a, Carl is a tragic figure. Mm-hmm. I, uh, oh, wow. So you got th- wow. three successes. Yeah, so you definitely are picking up. Like, you're starting to, like, especially with what you were thinking about when you went in there, you're starting to feel like, oh, man, this lady, like, uh, I would say it's on you on how you feel Katal would, would digest this, but it definitely, I think, would add, in my opinion, more of that sense of like, fuck, dude, like a guilt in a way, even though you weren't responsible for it, but you were uh, witness to it, you know? Uh, listen, uh, I, I, see, I see what you're trying to do, but uh, you see, Chase, uh, uh, he is, uh, he knows what he wants. And he, well, actually, no, he doesn't really, know. he, and he thought, and with him, it's more like he forgets about the things, things that in the uh, sidelines that even though they might be important things to remember, like, you know, making sure you don't shoot everyone in the head, but it's easy for him to lose sight of that. So. Well, can you talk to him for me then? Listen, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you in an uncomfortable position, but I feel like, like he won't notice and he doesn't listen to me when I try to talk to him. And I, the, this is the only way that I could get his attention. But if you could talk to him and tell me, like, kind of without saying that we talked, and maybe have him like kind of notice me again, that would, I would I would do whatever you want. I'd be in your debt. They're you all corrupted. Know. Yes, 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 yes. I I will speak to him and uh, keep that. In my, yes, I will speak to him about that. Uh, it's gonna be a bit tricky, though. He's not the easiest person to talk to, as you well know. So, yes, I'll keep, I'll, I'll uh, do that. And remember, this, this it's gonna be an ongoing thing. So, yeah, I'll keep you posted on when I need that favor. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate. It. Thank you. And again, if you need anything, let me know. Okay. Will do. Hello, folks. Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts, or just media in general that deals with your favorite White Wolf role-playing games? Or have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded, one which wouldn't be drowned out by random posts and discussion so that your media could get the attention you want? Well, we have the answer for you in a Facebook group we run called White Wolf RPGs Gameplay and Media. The group is specifically ran with the sole intent of it being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. We are currently over 1,000 members strong, and we are continuing to rapidly grow with new media being shared every day. 
stop on by. We hope to see you there.